Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just give us one minute as we uh, adjust the camera here, and then we'll get right into the tour. Welcome to the Phelps Mansion. My name is Joe Schirsch. I'm the house manager here and uh, I will be showing you guys around today. Um, this is kind of a new thing for us um, given the, the situation right now. So if we have any technical difficulties, just kind of bear with us and we'll, uh, if we lose the feed, we'll get right back into it as quickly as we can. Um, if you have any questions, um, certainly uh, ask them. I'll try to answer any that come up. Mark Dickinson, our board chair, is behind the camera and uh, will be following around uh, with us today. We're just going to give it another minute or so to uh, let some more people join in on the tour. Um, if you're not from Binghamton, um, or even if you are from the Binghamton area, um, maybe comment where you're watching from. Uh, it be interesting to see uh, where we're reaching. So uh, just give it another minute or so and then we'll, we'll get going. We're really looking forward to uh, sharing the history of our house and uh, we'll also throw in some uh, Binghamton history as well, especially for those of you who are, are not familiar with the city. So virtual tours are not uh, a new thing. Um, in fact, they can be traced back to the 19th century in some aspects. Um, Sir Charles Wheatstone created a binocular type device in 1832 called a stereoscope that enabled each eye to view each image separately, thus creating a three-dimensional effect. He originally used uh, daguerreot photos in 1840, Sir David Brewster tweaked Wheatstone's device, and in 1851 at the Great Exhibition, Queen Victoria took fancy to the, to the device and what the Queen likes, the world likes. In 1856, the London Stereoscopic Company had pushed mass production of stereo cards into most middle and upper class homes. With their success, the company began sending photographers around the world to create stereo cards of over 100,000 different places and views. In 1861, with the help of Joseph L. Bates, Oliver Wendell Holmes designed a handheld stereoscope viewer, like the one you're seeing here on the camera now, that allowed individual adjustments for viewing. So, we, we talk a lot about the history of our building, um, but I do think it's important that we recognize the history of the city of Binghamton as well. And um, I, I don't often, I'm not, I'm not an expert in Binghamton history, I'm more of an expert in this history. So I got some cheat sheet notes here just to keep my mind uh, on track. But Binghamton sits at the confluence of the Susquehanna and Shenango rivers. Um, it was originally an Iroquois Indian settlement um, unfortunately, the uh, Iroquois were pushed out of the area uh, during the Sullivan-Clinton campaign in 1779. Uh, they were basically forcefully removed from the area. Settlements were destroyed. People were taken prisoner. Um, in 1787, the first settlers started arriving here in Binghamton, um, and the area was originally known as Shenango Point. Uh, around 1800, the village was laid out. Uh, by a gentleman named Joshua Whitney, who was working for William Bingham. William Bingham was a wealthy Philadelphia merchant, and uh, he owned a lot of land here in upstate New York, and he also owned about over two million uh, acres in the state of Maine. Uh, it was known as Bingham's Purchase. Um, one of the biggest things that helped with the development and the growth here in the city of Binghamton was the Shenango Canal, which was begun in 1834. Uh, with the canal uh, eventually going all the way up to Utica and connecting to the Erie Canal, uh, Binghamton started transitioning from more of an agricultural based society uh, to more of an industrial society. Um, the canal was in use for quite some time, but by 1878 um, it was eventually filled in and paved over 
in this today known as State Street here in Binghamton. Um, in 1848, the trains began arriving here in Binghamton, referred to as the Iron Horse. With the trains, Binghamton became a central railroad hub, and a lot of new industries started popping up. Uh, so Binghamton became a very industrialized city. Um, in fact, if you, if you had the time uh, to research, you would see that there were a, quite a bit of things made here um, in the Binghamton area. Um, one of the largest manufacturers uh, during the time of our house, which was 1870, was cigars. Um, by 1890s, cigar was the largest manufacturing uh, industry in Binghamton. There were uh, many cigar factories throughout the area employing many employees. Uh, and uh, eventually Binghamton was number two in the production of cigars, uh, only behind New York City. Um, later in life, um, as you get into the 1900s, you have the Bundy Time Recording Company, uh, the Endicott Johnson Shoe Company, IBM, Ansco Film, and the list could go on and on. Um, but I know that we're here to talk about our house, so um, I think we should dive right into our tour. Uh, we're standing in the front parlor, or I'm sorry, the front doors of the Phelps Mansion here. Uh, you can see there are quite large doors. Uh, we're going to move into the parlor and come back to this area in a little bit. Uh, but I want to talk to you more about the Phelps family and uh, who he was. So if you would like, please follow me into the parlor. So we're standing in the, the formal parlor. Um, before we talk about the house, I just want to talk about um, Mr. Phelps, uh, whose portrait you can see uh, over here above the uh, piano uh, in the corner. Uh, Sherman Phelps was born in 1814 in Simsbury, Connecticut. He was the youngest of nine children. Uh, when Mr. Phelps turned 14 years old, he uh, completed his eighth grade education and moved from Simsbury uh, to Dundas, Pennsylvania, where he joined his two older brothers in the operation of a glass factory uh, that they were overseeing there. Uh, he worked in the factory alongside his brothers, kind of learning the world of business uh, until around the 1840s when he moved from Dundas to Tonkanic, Pennsylvania. He opened a general store there. The business became very successful, and uh, eventually he would start investing money in railroads and coal. Um, and that was one of the ways that uh, the fortune kind of started. Uh, the other way was that he married uh, into wealth, uh, not once, but twice. So that's always uh, uh, very handy when trying to uh, build a new fortune for yourself as well. Uh, Mr. Phelps married his first wife in 1842. Uh, her name was Susan. Uh, they did have a baby daughter named Stella. Unfortunately, Stella only lived to be uh, four months old, and Mrs. Phelps died three days later. Uh, she was 21 years old when she passed away. Um, he would not remarry until around 1853 when he met his second wife, Elizabeth. Uh, they were wed, and in 1854, uh, Sherman and Elizabeth moved from Tunkhannock to Binghamton. And when he arrived here in town, one of the first things he did was help to establish the Susquehanna Valley Savings Bank, which was two blocks down the street. Later, he was part owner of the Gas and Water Company here in Binghamton. Uh, he was an investor in many of Binghamton's earliest industries. And in 1872, he was elected the fifth mayor of the city of Binghamton. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Phelps had two sons, Robert and Arthur. Uh, they were both born here in Binghamton as well. Um, unfortunately, Mrs. Phelps never saw this house. Uh, she passed away in 1861 at the age of 35 years old. Um, at that point, uh, eventually an older niece joined the family. Her name was Sarah, uh, Sarah Phelps, Ireland. And um, she, she kind of, filled the role of lady of the house for, for Mr. Phelps. Um, and she would remain here, uh, even when they weren't living here, but at their other house, she came here when this house was built. And she would stay here with the family until 1878 when Mr. Phelps passed away. Um, she would go up to Syracuse and live out the rest of her life up there. Um, so a little bit about the house. Uh, Sherman Phelps had this house built in 1870. It cost $120,000 to build it, and it was completed in 18 months. It had all the modern luxuries that you could have at that time. It had gas lighting, it had central heat, it had four bathrooms. Originally there were over 20 rooms in the mansion. We have three floors plus a basement. 
downstairs as well. Um, and all the ceiling heights are 14 feet through all the top three floors of the building. Uh, Mark, if you could turn around behind the blue chairs there, you can see one of the, uh, the heat vents supplying the central heat to the house. There's a giant coal furnace in the basement that would supply the, the central heat to the mansion. Uh, they also had nine fireplaces throughout the house as well to aid in keeping the, the house warm and comfortable on cold Binghamton nights. Uh, the light fixtures throughout the first floor were strategically placed opposite mirrors so that the light would reflect and help brighten up these big rooms. Uh, and then during the daytime hours, uh, especially on sunny days, we have these gigantic windows throughout the house that allow natural daylight um, to come through the building. The house is filled with uh, all different types of woodwork, different types of marble. Um, in this room, the lighter woodwork that you're seeing here is bird's eye maple. The darker wood is rosewood. Uh, we also have a little bit of fiddleback maple here around the fireplace. And you'll see some of the marble here as well. Uh, of course, the largest portion of marble throughout the house is the uh, Italian marble floor, which is lined in the main hall of the mansion. Um, the furniture is not original to the family. Uh, they're period pieces. Uh, basically, the only thing are original to the mansion are the things that are built into the house today. And I'll explain more about why that is as we continue uh, along with our tour here. Uh, on the right side of the fireplace, we have a portrait of Sherman Phelps' daughter-in-law, Harriet. Harriet married uh, the oldest son, Robert, in 1879, just a year after Mr. Phelps passed away. Um, Mr. Taylor, her father, was another wealthy businessman here in the area. Um, and, and, and in fact, the Taylors lived right down the street. Uh, Court Street was once a, a row of mansions here. Uh, today, we are the last of the big houses left on the street. All the other ones were torn down um, between the 1930s and 1960s. As, as Binghamton became more commercially developed, we lost a lot of uh, great buildings in the area. But uh, thankfully, we still have some to enjoy today as well. So, um, Over on the other side of the wall here is Sarah Mather Rogers. Um, Sarah is kind of like an in-law to the family. Um, she was related to Norman Phelps, who was uh, one of Sherman's uh, brother's sons. So uh, her portrait was donated by a uh, family who still lived in the area to uh, hang in our parlor because of the Phelps family connection to the building. So we're going to move from the formal parlor here, which was where the family would entertain guests, and cross through these beautiful pocket doors into the uh, back parlor, also known as the library today. So the, the back parlor, um, also like I said, referred to as the library, um, kind of has an interesting story. Uh, the large bookcases that you're seeing here on either side of the fireplace, um, although they look like they, they belong in this house, uh, they, they were never really in place until 1923, which was much after the Phelpses were here. Um, some people say that they were originally meant to be here and uh, the architect's granddaughter had returned them to the house in 1923. It's, it's kind of a story that we're not really sure of the exact answer, um, but uh, you know, as you can see, they, they do look like they belong here. So it does kind of make some sense that maybe they were actually meant for this house. Um, on the fireplace, you can see these beautiful bronze griffins. The griffins uh, are mythological creatures. They represent strength and power, and they appear on the Phelps family crest. Um, so there are griffins incorporated throughout the architecture of the house. I'll point out the others as we move through the uh, mansion. Over on the wall, we'd like to just give a shout out to the architect of the house here. Uh, this is Isaac Perry. Isaac uh, was from Bennington, Vermont, um, and later grew up in Keysville, New York. Uh, eventually, he moved to New York City, where he was working and training under an architect there, before coming to Binghamton around 1854. Um, he had won a, a contest to design the New York State Inebriate Asylum here in Binghamton. It was the first 
facility to designed and built to treat alcoholism right here in Binghamton. It was the first in the country. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that when we go upstairs so you can see the building that we're talking about. Um, Isaac Perry designed a lot of buildings here in Binghamton. Um, he helped complete or helped design the courthouse, uh, four churches, other residences. Um, and, and then in 1883, he was called to Albany by Grover Cleveland, who was then governor of New York, um, to finish the state capitol building. The state capitol building, um, eventually, it took 32 years to build it. Um, in 1899, Governor Teddy Roosevelt um, decided that he had had enough of the building, uh, of spending money on it, um, and so he declared it finished. And so in 1899, Isaac would return to Binghamton permanently. Um, he was appointed state architect during his time in Albany. He designed several armories throughout the state and um, he would live out the rest of his life here in Binghamton as well. Um, the Capitol building is a beautiful building. Um, the, the irony is that the, even though it took 32 years to build it, uh, technically it's still not finished. If you ever have the opportunity to tour the Capitol building, um, the guides there will point out several parts of the building um, that are left unfinished. Um, and it doesn't have its dome. Uh, it's the only state capitol without a dome. And uh, it probably never will have a dome. But uh, there were four different architects and Isaac was the last to, to wrap things up up there. So um, we'll move on. Are there any questions so far, Mark, that you've seen? Or um, people just kind of watching and listening? Yeah, people are watching and okay. listening. Um, we'll move on to uh, the next part of the house. I will point out um, behind us uh, here, off in the corner, you can see that room with the bright floral wallpaper in there. Uh, today, that's a bathroom. It was originally built to be a closet, but it was converted to a small bathroom in the 1900s. interesting thing about the house, of course, is that the Phelps family did employ a staff um, of at least three or four, sometimes maybe even five people. Um, most of the staff um, lived here. There were some bedrooms upstairs dedicated to the staff of the house. Uh, There's also an area downstairs for the cook, uh, which is where the original kitchen was in the basement as well. Um, a, a long time ago, when things were being done in the ba uh, basement of the house, uh, there were actually speaking tubes found in the walls. Uh, so it's believed that uh, the speaking tubes were the original component of the house to be able to communicate from room to room. At some point, those were removed uh, and covered over, and the call bell, uh, like Mark had just kind of showed you here, um, the call bell system was placed throughout the mansion instead. So today we have these little buttons all throughout the house. Um, the photograph up above is Isaac Perry holding his granddaughter, Lucretia. Uh, and then up above that photo is another photo of Lucretia when she was older. Uh, she ended up marrying Sherman Phelps' grandnephew, William G. Phelps Jr., um, around 1917. So uh, with that being said, we'll, we'll move on and we'll continue our tour into the uh, front hall of the house here. And if I forgot to point out the woodwork in the library, the, the woodwork in there is walnut, uh, which is also carried over out here into the hall. Uh, we have the, the hall is lined with burl accents. So you can see the burl here. Um, and lots of mirrors uh, in the hall to brighten up the center of the house. We do have a calling card table here nearest our back door. Uh, calling cards were dropped off to the house at the rear uh, by anybody wishing to call upon the family. Um, like most wealthy houses, you couldn't just drop in unexpectedly. Calling cards would be sent down and, and then invites would be sent back, uh, usually within a week, to let you know if the family would uh, allow you to uh, call upon them. Uh, so that's what this table is here. Uh, the top piece more than likely had more mirrors across the entire top. And uh, you can very faintly see where there are holes here now. Uh, there were once hooks there to hang your hats and things as you came from the back of the mansion. 
Uh, in the middle of the hall, we have a black walnut staircase. It's estimated that the staircase cost about $5,000 to build uh, when the house was constructed. Um, black walnut's a very hard, durable, long-lasting wood. And uh, as you can see, when we have a lot of people who go up and down these stairs every year, and uh, they're, they're still holding strong 150 years later. Um, at the newel post here, we have these hand-carved cranes. You can see the cranes there, all carved out of wood, and a beautiful light fixture here um, as well, uh, kind of helping to brighten up the middle of the hallway. Over on the other side, behind us, I'll let Mark turn the camera here. Uh, way up in the corner, you can see those winged griffins again. And in the crest are Sherman Phelps's initials. There's a S, a D, and a P for Sherman David Phelps. You can see the way this large mirror here, which is surrounded by African mahogany wood, um, reflects the grand staircase here. So again, it opens up the hall and makes the house feel more spacious uh, as well. We do have a cool little drawer here. Um, it's up, to, up for debate as to what it was actually used for. We call it our glove drawer today. Uh, we do have a little pair of gloves in here, uh, but it's just kind of a neat little, neat little drawer. If anybody actually has seen one or knows what it might have been used for, let us know in the comments. You can help us solve a mystery. So, uh, With that being said, we're going to move up to the, the front doors of the house here and show you the in-between spaces of the, the double doors. These are this is a little bit of a tight space in here, but um, tall, kind of feel like you're in a fancy elevator, so to speak. Uh, we have beautiful mah mahogany woodwork throughout the room. And if you look up in the four corners, um, you'll see these beautiful Corinthian columns with their very ornate capitals carved out of wood. Um, up above, you have a coffered ceiling. Uh, up there, kind of looks like someone stuck a door on the ceiling up there. Uh, so a very nice entryway as you're coming in the front of the house. Um, I was going to pop the front doors here for just a minute to show you that the front doors have no doorknobs. Um, because again, this was a house you had to be let into. You would have received your invite and the maids would know basically who was showing up at the house on any given day. And so somebody would be here to show you into the, to the house. Uh, all of the hardware on the doors is original to the building. Um, there's a little keyhole here, so if the family came home and wanted to use their front door, they certainly can. Um, do you want to take a look out front real quick? For just sure. A okay. It's a little bright out here, so I don't know what the camera's going to do as we step out. Um, but right next door here, where our library is today, was once a location of the mansion. Then there were a few more going down that way. Uh, the cast iron fence surrounds the entire property there were a, there was a fountain in the front yard where this big tree is today and then there were raised flower beds throughout the yard as well um, if you guys are getting a little peek of the church across the street that was built in 1893 uh, st mary's church and really this was the end of the road uh, we're two blocks from downtown binghamton but this this really was the the edge of the city when mr phelps had this house built um, as binghamton grew in population then with you know it expanded outward at that point so uh, we're going to go back inside and we'll head into the receiving room next so the receiving room uh, of the house is basically like a fancy waiting room. It's where guests would typically be asked to wait. Uh, this is also walnut in here um, as well. You can see around the fireplace with this beautiful tile with English ivy. Um, pretty good looking uh, considering how old it is. Um, still bright as ever. The uh, light fixture in this room is from New York City. It was made by a company called Pottier and Stymus, and they made furniture and light fixtures for these uh, Gilded Age mansions. 
You can see the figure on, this, on the chandelier there is Athena, the goddess of wisdom, war, and justice. Now, it just so happens that Mr. Phelps, while he was still living in Pennsylvania, served as a judge for two years in the Wyoming County Courts. He was an associate judge. Um, and so for the rest of his life, he preferred the title of Judge Phelps or, or the Honorable Sherman Phelps, uh, which is why um, if Mark pans down there, you'll see we have a judge's gavel on the table there. Um, but oddly enough, that's not the only place the gavels appear in this room. If you look around the room, there are gavels carved into the woodwork on all four sides of the room here uh, so that you did not forget that you were in Judge Phelps's house. So it's a little, a little throwback to his uh, title preference here. Some may say he had a little bit of an ego and he, given that he was a very wealthy man, he, he probably did. <laughs> so there's no, we won't dispute that fact. So, uh, but again, you can see nice bright room here uh, throughout the house. Um, with all this light coming through these giant windows. Uh, you know, on rainy days, of course, uh, the house is a much different uh, environment uh, because it's very dark and uh, dreary in here. The windows do have shutter systems, uh, so you can close the window completely off um, from the sunlight, um, or you could open up both sets of shutters or go half and half, however you prefer to do it. Um, they probably would have kept the bottom ones closed for privacy and had the top open for light. Uh, during the summer months, we, you could close all the windows off and then help keep the house dark and cool by shutting the shutters, shutting the shades, you know, drawing the curtains, those types of things. So, uh, anybody have any questions so far? Or are we still just watching? Watching? <laughs> okay. Commenting on how wonderful it is. Oh, okay, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you guys are having a good time. Uh, we, we certainly are, are um, excited to be able to share this building with you. Uh, we were kind of sad when we had to close down and uh, you know everything's kind of up in the air so who knows when we'll be able to get back in the building again after this point so um, we're going to make the most of this tour uh, because it could be a while before we have another one so uh, we're going to move to the dining room next um, as we do i don't know if the phone will pick this up or not um, but as we leave this room if you look at the placement of the hall mirror out in the main hall in the dining room here, it does look like hallways that go on forever. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see that um, on the camera, but uh, it's kind of a cool illusion. So it makes the house feel bigger as you come in the front doors. So uh, with that being said, we're going to move to the dining room next. This is the one and only dining room in the house. Um, by some mansion standards, this is not a very large dining room. Um, in fact, Mr. Phelps, this dining room only typically would seat about 10 guests. Um, he, he really wasn't much of an entertaining kind of guy, you know, especially after he lost his second wife. Um, you know, he kept entertaining minimal, and if he did, it was it was on a smaller setting. So. Um, he did have a large billiards room on the third floor of the house though, so if in the event they needed a bigger space, uh, they could typically use the, the billiards room on the third level of the house. Um, as you look around the dining room today, you'll see this beautiful um, oak woodwork. Uh, with the chair rails are lined with burl. The wall covering is not original to the house. It was put up in the 1970s because by then the original wall covering was about 100 years old um, and, and not looking very fitting for a, a grand house like this. So it was, it was changed at that point. Um, Mark probably just got a quick glimpse of the chandelier there. I don't know if you guys caught the squirrels at the top. There are the chandeliers from England. There are three squirrels up there uh, holding what I believe are walnuts or acorns. And then we also have the acorns and oak leaves all around the chandelier here, uh, which is, again is fitting because we're in an, we're in an oak, uh, a room filled with oak woodwork. Um, over on the original sideboard here, I'll let Mark slowly pan the camera around so you guys can see the sideboard. There's a lot of uh, decorative detail in it. Beautiful, beautiful carvings throughout the sideboard. 
I'll point things out and I'll let Mark get a little bit closer, but you can see we have a lion's head here. Uh, and then up above the mirror, there's a fox's head. And then directly underneath them, there are carved grapes on either side of the mirror and, and just above the mirror there. So the maids could set things down here and then serve to the guests or the family that was seated at the table. Uh, as Mark moves around the dining room here, I'll point out the uh, fireplace. Uh, you can see on either side of the fireplace there are carved fish. Uh, the details are, are amazing. I mean, you could actually, if you were to touch it, you could feel the scales um, of the fish carved into the woodwork there. Uh, we also have a cluster of fruit directly below the mantel here as well. Uh, and then, of course, the most interesting thing in the dining room is uh, what's up above the fireplace. Uh, those are stuffed European woodcock behind glass with a painting like diorama setting behind them there. Uh, and believe it or not, those, those are original to the house. That box has never been disturbed. No one's been brave enough to attempt to touch them, thankfully. And so there, there they stay uh, for who knows how many more years. <laughs> Hopefully a long, long time. Uh, so we're gonna uh, quickly uh, just show you guys the conservatory, which is also off the dining room. Um, you see he's got these glass pocket doors here. So it allows the light from the eastern side of the house to kind of flood the dining room. Um, if you, if a long time ago, the conservatory would overlook lawns and gardens that were out there on the side of the mansion and uh, not a parking lot, which is what we have out there today. Um, the room itself was filled with plants and according to the inventory of the house, the Phelps had six cage birds living in the room. Uh, there was always a fountain uh, in here as well. The one you're going to see as Mark moves into the room is not original. This one was added later. The original one actually stood in the middle of the room and was removed at some point. Um, also in there you'll see a photograph uh, uh, of uh, the original carriage house that stood on the property. Uh, that carriage house would have been there until about 1904 and would have stood right outside uh, the side lot here as well. So. I'm going to step back and let Mark take you guys into the conservatory for a minute and then we'll move to the butler's pantry. A couple quick that. questions here. Okay. Are all the fixtures original to this room? To this room? As far as we know, yes. Uh, we, we do know that at some point, um, as the years went on, some fixtures were added to the house or changed, but it, it's our understanding that, uh, especially this one in the dining room, has always been in place. All right, there's another one here. Uh, what are the tubes in the corners of the room? I'm guessing the heating tubes? The radiators? Oh, uh, uh, if you're talking about these, these yeah, these are radiators. Um, so this is the pipe work for the radiator, which you can see they, they wrapped in wallpaper to kind of blend the pipe in here. Uh, the radiators were added uh, later. Um, eventually the fireplaces were all taken out of service and uh, are no longer operational. Uh, so the radiators were added so that there were still two sources of heat to keep this building comfortable in the winter time. So. All right, we're going into the... Uh... Yeah, if you want to take them into the conservatory for a minute. like to point out as Joe mentioned earlier all the rooms in the house have shutters they are all pocket shutters and they fold up so they do not interrupt your view of the beautiful outdoors and then this is a picture of the carriage house oops try not to get the glare on here And that's the carriage house right there. 
and it is believed it would have been right outside this window here. Just around, oh, I oh, can't see it because of the curtain. Oh, actually, no, but there's a tree here. On, it would have been right out here on the side of the road there. Are these the tie backs you want to see right here? Those are some pretty impressive tie backs there. Mm -hmm. Pretty forgiving too. I've hit my head on them more than once <laughs> coming up after turning off a painting light and they don't budge. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Any more questions, Mark? Are we good? Uh, let's see. How tall are the ceilings? Oh, uh, 14 feet on all three levels. The only lower ceilings, which really aren't that low either, are in the basement of the house. The, the house stands, stands on a very large uh, stone foundation. Um, and there are large pieces of slate um, making up the floor down there. Uh, some of that you can still see down in the basement, uh, but some of the basement has been modernized uh, as the years went on. So, uh, any others before we come on? Uh, let's see. Oh, Chelsea popped in saying all the fixtures are original to the house. Gas and layers have been removed to different locations over the years. Yes, that is true. Thanks for your help, Chelsea. Thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> How are you doing? Chelsea's our treasurer, so uh, hi, Chelsea. Uh, so uh, as much as the Phelpses are a very important part of the history of the house, unfortunately, their stay here was very short. Um, I mentioned earlier that Mrs. Phelps had died before the house was built. Mr. Phelps died in 1878. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the niece moves to Syracuse, uh, the son and daughter-in-law uh, take over the house, and, and Arthur's still here as well, the youngest son. Uh, but tragedy would strike the family uh, just two years after Dad's death in 1880. Um, Arthur Phelps died at the age of 21 years old uh, from spinal meningitis. Um, and then if that wasn't bad enough, the very next year, uh, the oldest son, Robert, uh, died. Uh, at the age of 26 years old from apoplexy, which uh, from my understanding is kind of like a stroke in today's terminology. Um, and then in 1882, just one year after Robert's death, uh, his wife Harriet died also at the age of 26 years old um, from what is uh, described in the obituary as complications of rheumatism. And when Harriet Phelps died, there were, they had no children. Uh, so basically, if you look at the family tree, uh, this line of the family tree um, goes extinct, dies off. Um, the house was closed up and kind of sat here for three years or so, waiting for uh, the estate to be settled. Finally, in 1885, the house was sold uh, to George Harry Lester, whose uh, father operated the Lester Shear Boot Company, which uh, later becomes the Endicott Johnson Shoe Company. Um, unfortunately, George made a lot of bad business deals and lost a lot of money, uh, and eventually the house went into foreclosure, uh, so his, his stay here was very brief. Um, in 1889, the house was rented by James Truman, who was at that time postmaster general for the city of Binghamton, and he lived here with his wife, his son, and his daughter, uh, and the son liked to play tennis, so at one point, uh, off the conservatory there, there were tennis courts uh, out on the side of the mansion for uh, Mr. Truman's son. Uh, well, they left in 1904 um, and moved out of the area. Um, at that point, uh, the house was then sold again. And this time uh, in 1905, it was sold for the last time to uh, 20 very wealthy ladies here in Binghamton called the Monday Afternoon Club. Uh, they were a club focused on the idea of educating ladies. Um, they used their club as a way to, to educate other, other women. Um, and they bought this house to use as a meeting place. Uh, one month after they bought the house, they were gonna, they were hosting the uh, Women's Federation of, uh, I can't think of the exact name, uh, but it was basically all the other ladies clubs from New York State, um, and so they knew they were gonna need a bigger place. So in 1905, they had a very large um, auditorium, what we call our ballroom today, um, built 
off the back of the house, which will be our last stop on the tour today. Uh, the Ladies Club grows over the years, um, eventually approaching a membership of about 500 ladies um, with a waiting list. And uh, the way this house is furnished today is the way the Ladies Club continuously filled it with things between the years 1905 and 2005. Um, in 2005, the club voted to disband. Uh, they could no longer afford to operate as a private club, and they, they, they knew that they had to do something different, and they thought the best idea was to turn it into a historic house museum, open it up to the public for support, and so today we are a New York State Historic House Museum. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and um, we are chartered under the Board of Regents as an educational facility as well. So, so that all kind of ties into the museum's mission. And so we've been a historic house museum since 2005. We are a staff of two, uh, myself and our executive director, and then we have a, a board of directors and about anywhere between 25 and 30 volunteers. Um, depending on the time of year, a lot of our volunteers are students from Binghamton University's history department. So uh, when they're here for school, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, extra help. Uh, and then of course, when they go home, uh, then we rely on our local people to help us get us through some of the busier times. So, couple questions. Okay. Where did the ladies get the funds uh, to build the addition? Club dues, perhaps? Um, well, they, they took out a mortgage um, for the house. Well, not them personally. They had to actually ask their husbands to take out the mortgage to buy this building because uh, ladies weren't allowed to do that type of thing. Um, the house was, the original asking price for the house was $25,000, um, but the owner of the, the house at the time, his wife was a member of the club, and he had given the club $10,000 to put towards the mortgage, so it's possible, and that's a really good question, no one's ever asked me that before, uh, it's possible that maybe with the discount that they got, that they used some of the funds to build the auditorium on the back. The, it, it is said that the ballroom cost about $5,000 to build in 1905. Uh, but again, they didn't always call it a ballroom. It was really referred to as an auditorium uh, during the days of the ladies' club. When did the Monday afternoon club stop? So, um, in, in 1986, there was, uh, there was kind of a dual entity here. We had the Phelps Mansion Foundation and the Monday afternoon club. But by 2005, when the, the club voted to operate as a nonprofit uh, historic house museum, uh, that's basically when the club ceased to. Well, wasn't 89 the foundation? 86. Oh, was it? 86, yeah. So. Any other questions? <laughs> now, you might ask, why did I tell you all that right here? The reason I told you that right here is because this next room is where we'll start to see the ladies' club begin to make changes to the house to, uh, to update it from a private residence to uh, what they call their clubhouse. So, uh, so we're gonna see some uh, updates to the house as we move into the next area of the building. And we'll also show you some more changes that they made um, as we go. So some you'll like, some you probably won't. But <laughs> so we're stepping into the uh, pantry of the house. The original kitchen was in the basement. Uh, there were two dumbwaiters that served the house. In fact, if you look over on the corner here where our dishwashing crates are stacked today, uh, that is where one of the dumbwaiters would have come up from the kitchen downstairs. Uh, the ladies had the dumbwaiter shafts closed off and sealed up because they weren't using them. Uh, and it was a fire concern to leave them in place, so they, they took them out. And so the dumbwaiters are, uh, one of the dumbwaiters is stuck in the basement, but the other dumbwaiter has been gone for many years. Um, and then behind me, we have uh, a very modern commercial kitchen today. It's believed, and it's probably a little dark in here. Can you see me okay? Oh, yeah. um, it's believed that this room may have been used by the Phelps staff as a work area here on the first floor of the house. Um, there are access to the back stairwells here in this room. Um, I'll pop this door open so you can see the backs. This is the staircase going to the second floor of the house. Um, there are th three sets of back stairwells, of course, uh, 
one to the basement, one to the second floor, and one to the third floor of the house. Um, kind of a winding staircase there. Um, and then over here in the corner where this outline is on the wall, uh, this was the location of the other dumbwaiter. There's nothing back there. It's just a false wall basically hiding the, the dumbwaiter shaft. So if someone came to the uh, back of the house, the carriages would pull up back here. There'd be these big windows here so they could see the carriages pull up under the covered driveway. The maids could sneak out this door here to answer the back door of the house <coughs> and, uh, you know, see what see who was there, basically. So uh, so this really was kind of a, a, a work area for them. So, Is this staircase made of walnut as well? The servant staircase? The, yes. Or the, I imagine staircase. the servant staircase. I believe that it's walnut in there, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, lots of walnut in the house. So. Uh, Ryan wants to know if he can get some of those Clorox wipes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for a premium. <laughs> yes, Maureen, uh, the back staircase is walnut. Yes. Okay. And th this is the servant oh, stairs. Oh, the basement stairs? Yeah. Okay, Here's, these are the basement stairs. And this would lead to the kitchen which would be on the left and the this way is to the house utilities okay okay like i mentioned earlier we're going to make our last stop into the uh, auditorium slash ballroom uh, but now we're going to head upstairs show you the second floor of the house we got a little seating area out here. Uh, this is an empire style mahogany sofa under the stairs here. It's uh, stuffed with horsehair. A uh, very heavy, solid piece of furniture. Doesn't move too much uh, except for during the holiday times it slides down just a little bit because we do have a, a big Christmas tree that goes here in the corner under the stairs. You can see how nice the underside of the staircase is done. So this would have been like a little seating area. Uh, you know, a lot of houses, some houses have ingle nooks, uh, some more fancy than others, uh, but this is probably like maybe our version of an ingle nook, but not quite as, uh, as elaborate as some other houses. So. so we'll head upstairs and check out the second floor. Servant yes. stairs are generally steeper, right? Yes. Yes, these are. Steeper and narrow treads. Uh, yeah. We don't use them too often. Uh, I sneak around them every once in a while, but uh, we don't typically take the public up and down those stairs. Because they are so. Because they are pretty treacherous. Yep. So, all right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna work my way upstairs, and then Mark will follow behind. And we'll go check out some of the bedrooms. What are the pictures on the wall here, Joe? Someone is asking. Oh, on the stairs? Yep. Um, Over so the years, well, do you want to say it? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Over the years, the ladies uh, collected art as well to uh, adorn the house. And this is just some of the collection. Yeah, on either side of the middle painting, those are uh, M. Van Wick, who uh, research has escaped us. We can't really find much out about an M. Van Wyck. These paintings were done around 1870. Uh, the one in the middle is uh, Harry Roseland. Uh, it's called The Fortune Teller. Uh, this was a series of paintings that he had done uh, based on the fortune teller topic. So uh, the ladies definitely did not spare, spare any expense when it comes to artwork. We have some beautiful Hudson River School paintings up here too. Someone mentioned the skylight. It probably would have been up in this area. We'll talk about this in a little bit. So this house is a, a little bit of different. I visit a lot of historic houses um, and it's kind of strange to 
come right up the top of the stairs and the first thing you do is walk into the master bedroom. Um, but that is the case here in this house. Uh, this was Sherman Phelps' master bedroom. He actually had this whole kind of L-shaped corner of the house here. Um, the room has a dressing room over here uh, with two built-in closets inside it. The ladies club had used that as a records room or storage room for a long time. Uh, thus, there's a very more modern carpet in there than we'd like to see. Um, hopefully at some point, maybe we'll, we'll take that room back to the way it would have looked like when Mr. Phelps was living here. Um, a, kind of a cool little story about this bed. Um, the bed that's in the master bedroom uh, belonged to one of the woodworkers who did some of the woodwork in this house. Um, his name is Orville Ronk. This is, this is Orville here. Uh, Orville had a wood shop down on Water Street, and he was involved in the carving of the wood in this house. Not all of it, but some of it. Uh, we do believe that he did some work uh, on the staircase, and uh, actually in the butler's pantry downstairs, I should have showed you guys, um, there's a, a drawer down there that's actually signed by Orville Ronk. It was uh, dated 1872, but it has his signature uh, on, the, on the back. You have to pull the drawer out to actually find the signature. Uh, but he made this bed for his wife for their wedding in 1872, and uh, it was gifted to the, donated to the museum in, uh, around 2009. Uh, the family also donated Orville's uh, tool chest. So we have some of his uh, original wood carving tools here in the house as well. Uh, upstairs here is where we also start to see um, some different light fixtures. Um, again, the ladies club like to move things around and also change things from time to time. So I can't say with certainty that these ones have always been here. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a cool fixture. Um, it's, a, it's a Wedgwood fixture and you can see the, the weights and the wheels up top there. Uh, it's actually designed so you can lower it by pulling it down and then you can push it back up uh, when you were done with it. So that's kind of a neat fixture. Uh, it's the only one in the house that does that. So, uh, But again, up here, I cannot say with certainty that this would have been the fixture that was in the room when Mr. Phelps was in this bedroom. You also see the woodwork up here is a little bit more toned down, which is typical uh, because these are just family spaces. Uh, even the fireplaces, although still nice, uh, they don't have the big mirrors over them. Um, and again, you don't really see as much decorative detail carved into the woodwork as you did downstairs. Uh, this corner door here leads to the museum's office today, but that was believed to be a sitting area uh, off the master bedroom. Um, and then, of course, we do have a master bath over here. Now, the bathroom is very much different than what it would have looked like when Mr. Phelps was here. The ladies' club was growing in size. Lost it. There we go. If we lost you guys temporarily, I'll just say the ladies club uh, was growing in size and, and needed more bathroom space. Uh, so that's when the bathroom was changed, uh, probably in the 40s or 50s at the height of their largest numbers. See, so, I think there's a couple questions here. Let me scroll down a little bit here. Yeah, if, and I promise if we're going to try to do our best to keep up. All right, let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, what are the pictures in the hall? I think we got that one, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm assuming if they're talking about downstairs. They were asking about the skylight, which we'll get yeah, to. Yeah, we'll get to the skylight. Yeah. Keep that um, in mind. Let's see. Oh, please show the Hudson River School paintings. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, if, we'll let Mark step out into the hall here for a minute. These paintings were all done by um, Edmund uh, Darch Lewis, uh, who was a Hudson River School painter. Um, and uh, a couple of them are from Delaware River, Delaware Water Gap. Um, I think the one in the middle is the, the, the Teofnioga River. Is that how you say it? <laughs> it's always a good one to say. <laughs> And then, of course, I think the other one down the end there is um, 
another one down Delaware River. Delaware River, yeah. They're beautiful paintings, though. Um, they were all donated by different members of the, the ladies' club. We actually do have an art tour where we talk specifically about uh, the different pieces of artwork in the mansion that was uh, done by one of our other docents who uh, took the time to research all the information and, uh, and, and, and was able to develop a tour uh, that we're hoping that we'll be able to share with our other docents. Uh, when we do reopen, so that we can continue to talk more about the artwork, oh. too. Oh, we flipped around here. Help me out here, Joe. What I hit? Flipped. Hey, how's it going, guys? <laughs> hit the wrong oh. button. I'm scrolling. Uh, Is it that one? Oh, yeah, right here. Right. Sorry right, about the close-up. Sorry about the... Didn't mean to scare anybody there. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, any other questions? Wreath on the wall by the bed. Ah, yes. Yeah. Mark, you can talk about that. This is a memorial wreath. It's made of wax. Um, they used to make them to memorialize when someone died. These are calla lily, calla lilies actually, or oftentimes to uh, remember an event or uh, some other sort of group gathering. But usually with the horseshoe shape here, it was meant to represent uh, the openness to heaven, if you will, which is why it was a memorial thing. This was made probably in the 19th century um, judging by the looks of it, I, I don't know which is, this one, this isn't a part of our collection, this one is part of our collection, but um, it was probably 1860s, eight, between 1880s, something like that, it was a very popular morning memorial item, and uh, you can learn more about those on our death and mourning tours of the 19th century in October. So I'm going to slide you back over to Joe, we're going to look at the room again real quick. Uh, someone was commenting about Matilda Van Wyck, um, M. Van Wyck. Um, we have looked at the, the only M. Van Wyck we can find, um, but according to what we've seen, uh, she was born in 1869, and those paintings downstairs were done in 1870. So, um, we, we, unless, unless somebody added a date to those paintings after the fact, but I don't know. So, the M. Van Wyck is kind of a mystery to us, but uh, um, I think that was Miss Blackburn, right? She was one of my mm -hmm. teachers in college, uh, <laughs> so uh, Miss Blackburn, if you if you can help us with that, uh, <laughs> let me know because uh, we appreciate any information we can find out about her. So or him. So this huge mirror was a later edition. Yeah. Um, at one point, the ladies of the Monday Afternoon Club rented the house for wedding parties and wedding receptions, and this room was where the bridal party would get ready. So it's probably safe to bet that this mirror was put up during those times when the when the brides were getting ready here in this room. No, not the brides, the bride, um, <laughs> and then the rest of the bridal party. So. Oh, that was Deborah. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> All right. So we're moving into this uh, front room here. Uh, this front room is another sitting area. Um, may have also served as a small office space for Mr. Phelps up here on the second floor. Um, this marble fireplace here, you know, is drastically different than the rest of the fireplaces in the house. Uh, we actually have two marble fireplaces up here. Um, uh, but the, the ladies of the Monday Afternoon Club would typically use these rooms up here for offices or sitting areas. Um, they play, they have bridge parties, so if they didn't have a big bridge party, they'd come up here and hang out rather than using the larger auditorium. Uh, we do have another Hudson River School painting above the fireplace. Uh, that's Peter Hansen. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys caught a glimpse of the family photograph near the door there, but um, that's uh, Mr. Ronk's family. Uh, and those are his 10 grandchildren on the picture there, surrounded by the, uh, the, the gentleman and the, the lady there off to the left side of the, paint, or the picture. Um, but uh, we actually used to have the bed in this room. Uh, it's called we call it the Ronk room. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, we actually took the bed um, out of this room and moved it to the bedroom, so that we didn't have to come upstairs and say pretend there was a bed here. We just put the bed there. So uh, so this room was set back up to look more like a sitting area um, today. Uh, over in the corner, there is a portrait of Mrs. Edward Cattell. She was one of the um, she was one of the founding members. Um, of the club. 
Uh, originally, the club was meeting as early as 1890, taking turns at each other's houses, um, reading books. They had subscriptions to magazines and, and books, and they would get together and uh, talk about uh, what they read. Um, but, but as the years went on, the club, like I said, was growing in size, and they started looking for uh, their own place to meet. Eventually, they were meeting in hotels, you know, in like little conference rooms or whatnot. Um, and then in 1905, they just decided to buy their own building. And, uh, and then that's when the club really uh, continued to grow in numbers. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the ladies as we move out into the upstairs hall here as well. There we go. It's a little dark up here on the, the front side of the hall here, but I'm hoping you guys can see these, these pictures here. Um, these are the charter members of the Monday Afternoon Club. Um, Miss, oh, Miss Hills, who's here, and Miss Childs here um, were uh, the original founding members, uh, both teachers. Uh, and again, they were using their club as a way to educate other ladies. Eventually, they put themselves on a speaking circuit and hosted several different well-known speakers of the time. Um, and off the top of my head, I can just name a few, but there were many. Um, Jack London, Carrie Chapman Catt, who was involved in the suffrage movement. Um, Amelia Earhart. Um, and in fact, you can actually see, uh, this is Amelia Earhart's check. Uh, these are checks written by some of the, written to some of the speakers uh, for payment for their speaking fees. Uh, but Amelia was uh, scheduled to speak here uh, to the club uh, just a couple years before she disappeared, but uh, they had to move it to the high school uh, because the, the interest in hearing her speak was uh, uh, much larger than uh, the auditorium of the Monday Afternoon Club could handle. So uh, the high school had a bigger auditorium, and so she spoke there. Um, I can't think of any other ones. Now, but uh, if you guys are curious to know more Couple. about the speakers, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll update it in the comments later uh, with some of the other people who spoke here. Um, but there were many, and there were some really good ones too. So um, we do have some old pictures here um, of different buildings here in Binghamton. Uh, this four story cast iron building here is known as the Perry Building, um, it was the home of Isaac Perry. He actually lived on the top floor, and the third floor was his architectural firm. Uh, it's a masonry constructed building, but the facade is all cast iron. Um, it's the only cast iron building in Binghamton, uh, still standing today. Um, the top three floors are used uh, as apartments by university students, and the first floor uh, is retail space, kind of changes out from time to time. Uh, then of course we have the picture of the mansion shortly after it was built. Uh, and then that's Mr. Phelps's bank, which was built the same year as the house. Uh, you can see it here under construction. Um, it stood until 1929, and then unfortunately it was torn down and replaced with the building that's uh, down on the corner of Court and Shenango Street today. Um, and then, of course, this one's one of my favorite pictures. You can see here's the mansion with the other houses that were once on the street. It's the 1894 view. There's the fountain in the front yard. Uh, there's the covered back driveway. Uh, so the ballroom is off the back here now, and this port cochere was moved to the side of the house uh, when the ballroom or auditorium was added to the back of the building. Uh, this is downtown Binghamton. So here's the Perry building. Here's the Phelps Bank. Uh, and then the mansion's right down the street, you know, we're two blocks away. You, you know, on a nice day, you could walk. Uh, the Broome County Courthouse is across the street. Um, and this photograph is definitely pre-1904 because the Security Mutual Building is here now, and, and that was built in 1904. So um, we also have these kind of, these are kind of cool pictures here. This is showing the corner of Court and Shenango. And this was the bank that Mr. Phelps, this was the building that Mr. Phelps originally started as bank in. Uh, but again, this one was taken down and replaced with the 
the one that you see here in the picture. The bottom picture shows a, a photograph around 1908 when the building had a fire. The uh, top floor of the bank building was destroyed and was removed um, after 1908. You, if you see photos of the building, you won't see that Monsard type roof. Just like the house has a Monsard roof, the bank building did as well. Um, and then the last building is the Dwight Block which was actually built to be a hotel, but was later converted to um, like apartment style housing, almost like brownstones. Um, and it's considered to be the birthplace of the Monday Afternoon Club. Um, it's where the ladies originally were meeting and, and where the club was first uh, thought up. So, uh, any questions or anything? No, let me see here. <laughs> Yeah, the, the video will be available after, guys, for sure. Um, we will share it to our Facebook page so that uh, anybody who might not have been able to join us can um, can watch it, and uh, anybody who wants to rewatch it can watch it. Um, and, and we'll, of course, still be monitoring all of our social media, so if you have any questions while you're watching it, just leave a comment, and somebody will get back to you for sure. So, um, I'll show you this one. Yeah, we got plaster... Beautiful plaster archways up here. Uh, this light fixture was added later um, because uh, the front of the hall can be quite dark at times. Base up here. Um, Hang on. Oh, there we go. We're back. What's that? Disconnected for a second. Oh, twice. Losing connection? Yep. On this corner? Go. Just enough. So far, yeah. So this whole side of the house here, guys, was once converted to an apartment for caretakers that were hired to, to work for the club. They were allowed to live in the building and they actually lived uh, in this corner bedroom all the way down to the other side. There are four rooms on this side of the house. Um, so we use two of the rooms for offices today. That's down the hall here. Uh, this room unfortunately is now a, an elevator lobby in 2002. <laughs> Uh, an elevator was put in the building so that the building could be handicapped accessible. So the bathroom was removed so that people could get on and off the elevator without having to walk through a bathroom to do so. Uh, so here you're seeing the little elevator tower. Um, this is the back wall of the house here. This used to be a window that I'm standing in now. And the elevator comes up right here. Um, if you look out the window, you can see this link between the mansion and then the roof to your left um, is the ballroom roof. And also, unfortunately, at some point, um, they thought it was a good idea to paint over the woodwork um, in, in most of these rooms on this side of the house, which is another reason why we um, basically use them for offices and things today, because they're not historically accurate at this point. Um, maybe someday we'll be able to get the paint off the walls and, uh, and use these rooms for other purposes. But uh, for now, they are as the way you see them. So, Colleen's got a question. Uh, was the Dwight Block fancy? Yes, it was. At the time, it was a technically high-end apartment uh, living. Yes. Uh, yeah, towards was... the end, it was a bit of a shame. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. it was torn down in 1982. It had a it had been neglected and run down, and uh, it was torn down then. But uh, in its heyday, back in the eighteen hundreds, uh, it was one of the most elite addresses in Binghamton, for sure. So, uh, and then of course, this room, guys, we use as a classroom today, um, since we are an uh, educational facility. Uh, this is like a classroom slash meeting room. Um, you know, depending on the size of the groups, we don't we don't use this room too too much because we have the bigger um, room downstairs uh, off the back of the house. Um, but we do have some things on display here. Uh, so when the kids come, we can talk about different things. Uh, over here on the table, we have uh, paper theaters, um, which were sold almost like a subscription base. Um, you, you could buy uh, black and whites for like a penny, color sheets for about two and a half cents. Uh, you buy these kits, put them together. They'd come with a full cast of characters and scripts. And um, you could put on a little show for your family. Um, there's some pictures here of, of families gathered together um, doing a little show. Uh, they have backdrops, just like you'd see at a, a real theater, where you, you know as the as the scenes change, you could uh, 
pull the curtains up to reveal the next scene of the play. So, uh, a bunch of cast of characters there. Yeah, I got a little and cast of, course, of characters. <laughs> Punch and Judy was a very popular uh, puppet show back in the 18th century, but that Punch and Judy goes way back centuries before that. Uh, they used to have political undertones. Uh, they used to mock the king and all that fun stuff. And some deemed them to be too violent, but they're still around today. You can go any, anywhere in England that, during the summertime and you'll find at least one Punch and Judy show going on. And they still have a few here in the US. And they also have teaching resources that you can put on your own Punch and Judy show. Uh, which right now, um, a lot of people are looking for things to do around yeah, their kids. Yeah. So, so paper um, theaters. You could paper uh, theaters are, you could build some paper theaters, put on a Punch and Judy show, all sorts of stuff. For a while. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so here in my hand, I'm, I'm holding a picture of the uh, New York State Inebriate Asylum. Um, again, uh, opened around 1858. Uh, this was one of many buildings on the campus. Uh, it was a self-sustaining um Place really. I mean, everything they needed was right there. Um, in in and around, I think it was around 1879 or so, um, the state actually converted it from an inebriate asylum to uh, an insane asylum. Uh, later in life, later in life, it was referred to as the Binghamton State Hospital, um, treating mental health patients and things like that. Um, unfortunately, the the building was closed um, around 1993. They put a new roof on it right before they closed it. They chopped down these towers because they were crumbling and they were afraid they were going to fall on somebody. Um, and the state still owns it. Um, it's actually in remarkably good condition despite being empty for, you know, over 20 years. It, uh, they turn the heat on every winter. It's secured. Um, there's security up there all the time. Um, and uh, the university is, is working with the public and the state to figure out what could be the next use for this building. Um, it's still on a state hospital site, so that kind of limits the, um, the opportunities for what it might be. Um, but we are hoping that um, at least part of it will become a museum to tell the story of the, the asylum. Um, because as you, I'm sure all are well aware, um, they did a lot of crazy things up there, uh, you know, different medical experiments and things. So um, those, those stories should, should be told um, and uh, it's also on the National Registry of Historic Landmarks, which is uh, a higher status than the National Registry of Historic Places, which is like, you know, we're on the National Registry of Historic Places, but uh, this is the National Registry of Historic Landmarks. It also employed a lot of local people for many years. It did, yeah, it did, it did. Um, and here, guys, you can see this is an old map of Binghamton. Uh, this one dates to around 1873. Um, here you can see the canal. So here's the rivers coming together at the confluence. Here's the canal that ran through Binghamton. Um, and then of course over here you can see the rail yards. Um, and this is where we are. So that's our house there with our little red flag there. So his bank was right here. Um, and unfortunately you can't see the, the castle. It's, it's further up off the map here, but... Uh, and there's where the courthouse is right here. Yeah, yeah. This is an 1882 map. Here you can actually see the castle up there in the corner. It uh, sits way up on the hill here in Binghamton. So um, the other thing I'll mention real quick uh, is the fireplace again. It's a marble fireplace. And if you notice in this room, in the room next door, when we go into the room uh, next, uh, both of these fireplaces have windows over the tops of them. Uh, so the chimney actually splits and goes around the window. Um, Isaac started messing around with this idea of letting more light in the house and, and putting windows over fireplaces. And so uh, he did it in this room and the room next door. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about in this room is probably the biggest change the ladies ever made to the house. Um, in 1941, uh, they really weren't using the third floor very much. And uh, it was discovered that it was suffering from really bad water damage. There was a leaking skylight, poor drainage, the walls were crumbling, the windows were falling out. Uh, it was just a big mess. Um, and eventually after uh, hiring an architect, they, they, they ultimately decided that the only thing they could do at the time, uh, I guess because it was cheaper, uh, was to remove the entire top floor of the house. So after 1941, uh, Mark, would you show them? This is what our house looks like when it's first built. 
You guys can see here's the, the Monsard roof with the iron cresting, uh, beautiful top floor there. After 1941, this is what the house looks like when the third floor was taken up. And I can hear all of you collectively gasping right now <laughs> um, at the major change in appearance uh, that occurs when this happens. Uh, so this roof um, was, was the replacement. So all the rooms that were up there disappeared in 1941. We have no photographs of uh, showing what the third floor looked like. All we have are blueprints um, that basically show the layout of the third floor. Oh, and uh, was it the records from the, the will or whatever? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. there's a billiard table yeah. and a couple chairs or something, right? Yeah, after, after the death of Sherman <coughs> Phelps, there was an inventory done. Um, and uh, that's how we kind of know what was up in those rooms. Now, if you ever find yourself in Binghamton uh, today, if you drive by the building, the house looks like this again. Uh, because around 1998 or so, uh, the, the club decided that they wanted to re replicate the third floor. And so they started raising money, and uh, by 2002 they had raised about $1.7 according to some of the minutes of the Monday Afternoon Club. Uh, and they, they had the third floor restored, sort of. Um, it's just the facade. There is nothing behind the walls anymore. The only thing that's upstairs on the third floor today is this roof. It's contained inside the new structure. Um, it's just an attic that we use for storage now um, because uh, you know they just didn't have the money to put the whole third floor back together. Um, the pieces were built here uh, by a local uh, company, uh, designed by a local architect. Uh, all of these pieces were built ahead of time and then stored in a parking lot. Here you can see the picture without the third floor. And uh, every day, uh, for quite some time, uh, these pieces would show up on a truck. There was a giant crane outside and it would, it would basically lift these pieces um, onto the building to uh, eventually give the appearance of the third story. Um, so today, you know, again, the house looks like that. Um, but nothing behind the walls. That's uh, probably one of our best kept secrets. Because <laughs> uh, if you didn't know any better, you, if you were just driving by, you would just assume it was a real functioning third floor. But that's not the case anymore. So um, it's unfortunate. Uh, but in other aspects, I mean, you know, it just would be another floor I'd have to clean <laughs> or heat. Um, so. Uh, in some ways, you know, there are pluses and minuses, although I personally would think it'd be cool to see the billiards room up there um, and where the staff would have lived and slept. Um, and then, of course, you come through this little passageway here and into the other uh, bedroom. Uh, this room here may have belonged to the niece when she was here. Uh, this light fixture is not original, I do know that. Um, I found a file that indicates that it actually came from an old house in Norwich, New York, and the ladies had it installed here in this room. Uh, what the original fixture looked like, uh, we don't know. Uh, no, no evidence of what that other fixture might have been in here. Uh, the fireplace, again, has the window over the top. It also has the shutter system so that you can close the window off uh, if need be. Uh, we do have a large collection of clothing uh, from the early days of the ladies club. Uh, we do bring them out from time to time and put them on mannequins and display the dresses and the clothing. Um, just depends on the time of the year and uh, if we have the people to be able to um, do that because obviously with the uh, old dresses, you know, you have to be able to handle them very carefully. And so they are stored appropriately in, in their boxes with their acid-free tissue. And uh, that's where they stay when they're not on display. Over on the other side of the case, we have some clothing from Lucretia Perry. Um, 
that's a little boy shirt up on the top right corner, but the other clothes and uh, accessories were donated by Lucretia Perry, who again was Isaac's granddaughter. I've used this room basically to house parts of their collection, kind of like an extension of exhibit space. Um, and that's, that's basically what we still use it for today. Um, cabinet over there full of all different types of uh, ceramics and pottery. Uh, we have this beautiful quilt here from 1901 that was purchased at the New York State Fair um, by the Ladies Club. It won first place. Connection. There we go. There we go. Brought it here ever since. <laughs> what is the little doll in the dress display? Yep. Yeah. That is a China doll, more than likely made in Germany. Uh, its body would have been stuffed with either sand, sometimes straw, or dog hair, or not dog hair, I'm sorry, horse hair. Uh, but this is probably more like sand, but it was a very popular toy in the uh, 19th century. There's a little bit of information here, I think, on it. That's, I think, more about like, what's in the case. Did I answer the right question? <laughs> oh, wait, um, start over. Go ahead. From Austria. Um, the story goes that it was shipped over from Europe, and one of the ladies uh, had, it, had asked to store it here temporarily. Um, and then nobody ever returned for it. Um, so many years ago, uh, legal documents were filed to accept ownership of the uh, desk as an abandoned property, so to speak. So today it, uh, it is part of the museum's collection. Uh, cool piece, very fragile, so um, we really can't open it. A yeah, piece that pulls good. out. Um, there are drawers on one side, and then like a filing cabinet type drawer on the other side. Uh, there are Kind of like wings that swing open with slots to put letters and things um, and when you open this up actually there are slots in there too so you could store things as well uh, these drawers were spring loaded and the button was located along this metal trim here so you have to know where the button was so that you could get the drawers to pop open um, by way of the, the spring releasing so any other questions any questions? Questions? I don't see any. Nope, I don't see any. Looks like we're good. All right. Moving on. So we mentioned earlier as we came up the top of the stairs that there was once a skylight in the house. Um, and that's because there was actually another uh, grand staircase that would have started right here and gone up to the billiards room. Um, I don't know if you guys can see the line in the wall there, um, but that's where the stairs would run. So you come up the stairs, go up another flight. So the ceiling that's right here now was put in in 1941. When the third floor was taken off, they closed this opening in the middle of the house. And so prior to that, you would have gone up about another 20 feet and there was a skylight up there and so all that light from up above on the roof would come down uh, in between the stairwells and obviously lighten up the middle of this house much more than it is today. Because um, as we mentioned downstairs earlier, it's pretty dark in the center of the house, but, but that's why, because it originally was designed to have a skylight up there that uh, was taken out, unfortunately. So uh, we're gonna move downstairs at this point and uh, show you the ballroom and uh, we'll wrap up down there for you guys. Give a quick pan up here real quick. Oh, yes. And for those curious, I'll show you actually where the dumbwaiter was. This is the dumbwaiter right here. Oh, it no longer exists. We do have a uh, lovely photograph of uh, what it looked like before it was taken out. But as you can see, there's nothing anymore in here. Just a, uh, it's kind of like a closet now. You have the rail here, which the, uh, the dumb waiter would have worked on. But other than that, 
And then over here, yeah, Carol, I'll give you one more shot of the bedroom here real quick. This is the stairwell that leads to the uh, third floor, which of course is now just a facade. But this is the servant stairwell, as you can see, narrow steps and all. Um, this goes up to the third floor, or the attic as it's now called. I'm sorry about the darkness here. And then, um, give you one more shot of the bedroom. How many original bedrooms, Joe? Uh, nine. There were four here on the second floor and five upstairs. Why is it called a dumbwaiter? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I can't say a scholarly answer here, but I, I would imagine it's because it was an inanimate uh, member of the staff. Right. <laughs> and uh, if you're for the curious, the service quarters, there were three service quarters upstairs, right? If I'm correct? There was five bedrooms up there dedicated to staff. Oh, upstairs? Yeah. Oh. And, um, and they, they also would have been, had a storage room and an and attic. From what I saw, the blueprints, they were along this wall here. Yeah, so there was oh, they there's, lined there this were three, yeah, I'm sorry, three, not five. Yeah. They, three. And then you had the, the other one over here that was a large bedroom. Yep. Correctly above. This house is all, all brick, so basically the floor plans are almost identical all the way up. I mean, the brick walls just run, everything is stacked on top of each other. This second floor has the exact blueprint of the first floor uh, of the house and, and it would have been almost the same thing at the top of the house yep barbara yes the third floor did have the servants rooms and in front of us directly above would have been where the billiards room was and there's also rooms for storage yeah straight up the top there yep right up there so the stairs would have gone right up and you would have walked right into the billiards room and then the servants quarters were on the left side of the house yeah, of course they were isolated too so there would have been a long wall running upstairs that yep. would have kept those separate um, from the billiards room, um, you know, the family spaces up the top floor. Yeah, and something said bathrooms earlier. Yes, uh, there were... There was four bathrooms. They had one in the basement, um, two on the second floor, and one on the third floor. The one on the second floor is here. Yeah. And that would have been Sherman's, and then the there, other one for the rest of the house would have been right there, and then directly above it on the third floor. Unfortunately, we have no original bathrooms to show right. um, because they were either removed or changed and updated um, by the ladies' club at some point. So we're now coming down the stairs. Could have. Like, yeah, quick. if you want. Yeah. Might yeah, we'll be a little windy out there, so we'll keep it brief. But for those of you who are following us from afar, um, might be nice to see the uh, Actually, building we'll, itself. Will we lose the internet? Huh? Will we lose the internet? Oh, I don't know. I hope not. Hopefully, we don't lose anybody. Stay with us. If we do, we'll come right back. Yeah. So here's the front porch of the mansion. I don't know how far we can go without losing the internet. If we can't go too far, we'll post a picture of the front of the building later.
Okay, we're back. All right, we'll make our last stop here in the ballroom, kind of wrap up our tour for you guys there. Um, Mark will give you one more quick look at the mansion and all the woodwork. So theoretically, this is the original back of the house right here. When I shut this door, this is the actual back of the house. Now we are stepping into the extension. The covered driveway would have been right over this door. Um, and then this is the elevator that was put in in 2002. So the building is fully handicap accessible and ADA compliant um, because of those updates that were made. Um, and then this is the the auditorium slash ballroom. Uh, you can see it's quite a large room. Uh, it does have a tin ceiling. All of the light fixtures in the room were um, changed. Uh, the original light fixtures weren't always so sparkly, uh, but again, when they were renting the room, they uh, decided to spruce it up a little bit at that time. So new curtains were added, the walls were painted, uh, these crystal light fixtures were added. Uh, throughout the room and on the ceiling as well. Uh, those were all changed out. The chandelier that's hanging here in the middle of the room today um, is also a replacement. The original light fixture that was hanging in this room had fallen overnight, um, also in 1941. And uh, as you can very well imagine, it didn't survive the fall. And so for a long time, there was nothing up in the dome uh, and in fact, at one point, the ladies club actually covered the ceiling with the acoustic um, drop ceiling tiles and all of this tin work was covered for a long, long time. Um, around the early 90s, uh, somebody was here working and they happened to take a ladder and poke their head up above the uh, drop ceiling and that's when they realized what that ceiling was hiding. It had basically been forgotten about all these years. Um, and so at that point, the decision was made to uh, rip the ceiling down, clean up the tin work, and, uh, and then spruce up the room at that point. Um, so of course, the last piece of the puzzle was getting the chandelier. Uh, so this one here actually comes from an antique store in Syracuse. And it has a fascinating history, though, because it dates to around 1890. It actually hung in Sherry's Restaurant in New York City. And if you can imagine, there were 16 of these beautiful chandeliers hanging in Sherry's Restaurant. Sherry's was catering to the clientele that was living on Fifth Avenue in New York City, much like Delmonico's Steakhouse. Well, anyways, they tore the restaurant down in 1917. And this chandelier, many of the chandeliers were sold off. This one ended up in Keith's Theater House on Salina Street in Syracuse, New York. And it stayed in the lobby of the theater until around 1967. And then that theater was torn down. And an antique dealer who's still in business um, had acquired it. And it remained in his collection um, until he sold it to the ladies club in 1998. Uh, the receipt for the chandelier is upstairs. It was purchased for around $38,000 um, with money that was donated by two uh, members of the club. Um, and so that's how we have the chandelier here in our room today. Uh, the stage, uh, Mark will pan around to the stage for a minute. The stage was added in 1931. Uh, we do have a Steinway piano that was bought in 1934, and we do a lot of um, functions here in the ballroom today. We have classical music concerts, we have uh, plays, we have history programs, we have teas, we have dances. Um, this room is always being used for something. Um, it, it holds, it seats 120, um, but uh, capacity is 156. So standing crowds too so um, and then of course uh, beyond the double doors is the last part of the building 
that was added in 2002, when they were renting, they wanted to have a bar. Are we losing? Are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay. They wanted to have a bar for functions. They wanted to have new bathrooms. So this new wing was added then. Uh, the bar is used primarily for check-in of our visitors today and uh, also doubles as our gift shop. Mark's panning up to the Monday afternoon club sign that would have originally hung uh, out of the front of the building. Uh, it was brought in and, and hung here when the museum uh, took over ownership of the building. Uh, because this is a wooden sign, it's, it's better in here uh, mm -hmm. than outside. And also, too, before this addition was added on and the one for the elevator, it was just steps that led into the door yeah, to, the uh, to enter the ballroom. Yep. So, there were a couple questions, questions okay. yeah, yeah. Let's go back in the ballroom and we'll answer questions. When was the acoustic ceiling removed? Right around 1998 or so. Okay, what, uh, do you know what year that they covered the, the original ceiling? With the, uh... um, you know, that's a good question. I can't say with certainty when it was covered, but um, it was, it probably, was probably shortly after the chandelier fell. Um, they thought this room was too loud, and they also worried about how much it cost to heat this big space because the ceilings, as you can see, are uh, quite high. Um, I think we have, I think they're 18 feet to the lowest part and uh, 20 to 22 feet to the top of the dome. Um, so it was short, probably shortly after the chandelier fell uh, that the acoustic ceiling tile was put in. So, yeah. Any others? Any final questions? Well, if there's no final questions, if you do have more questions, you more than certainly, like I said, you can ask them and we'll, we'll get back to you on them. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, typically our tours last an hour, um, but as a standard, I always talk more than I should. Um, so we went a little over, but um, I hope uh, wherever you are, you stay safe. And uh, if you can come visit the museum when we open, uh, we appreciate it, we'd love to see you. Um, if you enjoyed your tour, we'll be posting a, a link to a donation page. Um, obviously, these are uncertain times for a lot of historic sites. Um, and so uh, donations will help get us through uh, the next couple of weeks um, until we can figure out uh, when it's safe to reopen the building to the public so that we can uh, start offering our tours and programs. Um, as you know, we've, we've closed down completely. Our tours are canceled. Our, our classroom, our school tours are canceled. Um, we've had to cancel events, um, already three large events that we've had to cancel. Um, those all represent significant income uh, to the museum, and we are a self-sustaining museum. We, we do not get any funding uh, from the state, the county, or the city. It, it, is, it is up to us to raise the funds to keep this building preserved and open and going uh, for future Binghamton residents and people from all around the world to be able to come here and, uh, and see our building. So, Thank you so much and have a great day.